mics, whatever you're listening in on, just so we can make sure we don't have any extra background noise. Yep. Oh, Kristen's on. Yep, I'm on. Can you hear me? Yes. Hey, Kristen. Okay. It's been so long. It has. I just unmuted myself for a second because I tell everybody, if you want, you can, if you have like another window, you can go get the final exam and make sure that Mount Olive Consultants is at, answering all the questions about Pepsi that are on the exam. And if they don't, you can ask the questions at the end of the presentation. So. Oh, thanks, Doc. <laughs> Thank you. No. More pressure. Great. Great. No pressure. <laughs> no pressure at all. <clears throat> Terry, whenever you're ready to get started, I think you're good to go. Okay. Professor Katie, we're good. Do it to it, as we used to say. Okay. Well, good evening, everyone. My name is Terry Parker, and I'm the team leader with PepsiCo, or with Mount Olive Consultants, and we're doing a case analysis, company analysis on PepsiCo. First, I'd like to start with a background and history of the company related to company events and mergers and acquisitions. In 1893, Caleb Bradham created what was known at that time as Brad's Drink, which in 1898 became what we all know as Pepsi-Cola. In 1932, the creation of Frito Company and the creation of H.W. Lay Company occurred. In 1961, the foundation of Frito-Lay was created by the merger of the Frito Company and the H.W. Lay Company. In 1965, the foundation of what we now call the present PepsiCo Company was created by the merger of Pepsi-Cola and Frito-Lay. In 1991, uh, there was a joint merger between PepsiCo and Unilever where together they worked on a marketing campaign for ready to drink teas in North America. In 1994, PepsiCo entered a partnership with Starbucks to jointly develop ready to drink coffee beverages. This was the North, called the North American Coffee Partnership. And in 1999, PepsiCo entered the New York Stock Exchange with an IPO of $2.3 billion at the time. We're now going to talk about the company's acquisition and mergers. In 1977, PepsiCo acquired and or merged with Pizza Hut. In 1978, the company acquired and or merged with Taco Bell. In 1986, the company acquired and or merged with 7-Up International, KFC, and Mug Root Beer. In 1989, the company acquired and or merged with Smart Food, Smith Crisps, and Walker's Crisps. In 1992, the company acquired and or merged with D'Angelo Sandwich Shops and Eastside Mario's Restaurants. 
1997, the company acquired and or merged with Cracker Jack Snacks. And in 1998, the company acquired and or merged with Smith's Snack Food Company, Tasty Food Egypt, Tropicana Products, and Barstool, which are Chili's second largest snack, which is Chili's second largest snack company. In 2001, the company acquired and or merged with Tasali Food, which is a Saudi Arabian snack company. In 2006, the company acquired and or merged with Izzy Beverage Company and Stacy's Pita Chip Company. In 2007, the company acquired and or merged with Sandora, which is a juice company in the Ukraine. In 2008, the company acquired and or merged with Spitz International and V Water, with, which are both UK-based vitamin water companies. In 2009, the company acquired and or merged with Corinto, which is a snack business in Peru, and Amacoco, which is Brazil's largest coconut water company. In 2010, the company acquired and or merged with PGB and PAS, which are two of the largest anchor bottles, and WBD, Wim, Bill, and Dan Foods, which is a Russian branded food and beverage company. And finally, in 2011, the company acquired and or merged with Mabel, which is a producer of cookies, crackers, and snacks in Brazil. That said, I will turn it over to Nick. Okay, next slide, please. All right, so now we're going to talk about PepsiCo's products and services. Uh, PepsiCo Americas is one of three major divisions implemented by PepsiCo. The remaining two are the Europe, Sub-Saharan Africa Division, and the Asia, Middle East, and North Africa Division. The PepsiCo Americas Division consists of several beverage brands, including Tropicana, Mountain Dew, Sierra Mist, and Gatorade. This division also consists of the Frito-Lay and Quaker Food brands. Frito-Lay offers a variety of branded snacks, including Doritos, Cheetos, Funyuns, Lay's barbecue chips, and Grandma's chocolate chip cookies. Quaker Foods offers both hot and cold cereals and an assortment of snacks, including Captain Crunch, Life, Quaker Instant Grits, Oatmeal, and Chewy Bars. Next slide, please. Uh, PepsiCo's Europe and Sub-Saharan Africa division spans in over 65 countries. Brands marketed here range from global iconic brands such as Pepsi, Tropicana, and Quaker Oats to well-known local brands such as Avaya Soups in Spain, Chudo Dairy in Russia, and Duvis Nuts in the Netherlands. Next slide, please. Uh, PepsiCo Asia, Middle East, and North Africa distributes and sells several leading snack brands, including Lay's, Cure Cure, Chipsy, Doritos, Cheetos, Smith's, and many Quaker branded cereals and snacks. They also sell various beverage brands, including Pepsi, Pepsi Max, 7-Up, Diet Pepsi, Mirinda, Mountain Dew, Aquafina, Slice, and Tropicana. Next slide, please. Uh, PepsiCo's food service innovations help their customers keep up with rapidly changing consumer preferences and expectations by providing them with access to innovative food and beverage offerings. PepsiCo's food service innovations include Pepsi's Fire, Hello Goodness, FlavorWorks, Miss Vicky's, Stubborn Soda, The Walking Taco, Cheetos Popcorn, Aunt Jemima's Waffles, Fresh Brewed Iced Tea, and the Aquafina Water Station. Next slide, please. So uh, Pepsi Spire is a connected digital fountain that makes the beverage experience more engaging by enabling consumers to create hundreds of customized drinks with flavor shots at the touch of a button. Hello Goodness offers convenient and great tasting, healthier snack and beverages on the go options. Originally launched as an innovative, sleekly designed glass, glass front vending machine, Hello Goodness features healthier products from PepsiCo's broad range of food and beverage options displayed in unique vending machines, coolers, and racks. Next slide, please. At PepsiCoFlavorWorks.net, 
Operators can access a bevy of information and tools to help design experimental eating solutions, including trends and insights that capture the wants, desires, and menu experience that today's consumers demand, from the latest burger trends to why diners are seeking menu items with more complex flavor combinations, a searchable library of more than 500 innovative recipes created using products from PepsiCo's broad food and beverage portfolio, seamless activation of customizable point of sale materials to market new menu items created through PepsiCo Flavorworks, and online, ac online access to PepsiCo's food service team of knowledgeable chefs. Miss Vicky's is the best selling hard by potato chip food brand and food service that's created using potatoes fresh from Miss Vicky's family's third generation farm. Stubborn Soda is a line of crafted, boldly flavored sodas made with the unexpected flavor combinations. Next slide, please. Uh, walking tacos are customizable mini meals that feature PepsiCo's chip brands. It includes a bag that serves as a bowl so consumers can add toppings to experience their favorite chip brands in a fun new way. Cheetos popcorn is a Cheetos flavored snack mix with a crunchy Cheetos included. Aunt, Jemima, Aunt Jemima's waffle iron program combines number one brand with a professional grade equipment platform, delectable culinary solutions, and a turnkey service program all through Broadline Distribution to deliver a complete solution in the fourth largest breakfast category in food service. Next slide, please. PepsiCo's portfolio of fresh brewed iced tea products provide freshly made by your favorite food service outlets daily. It features Lipton, Pure Leaf, and Tea Kitchen tea brands. Aquafina Water Station enables consumers to dispense wa customized water on the go. Consumers can pour flavors like peach or raspberry lime, sparkling or still water, into refillable bottles, which helps to minimize plastic waste in the process. And now I will hand it over to Elizabeth. All right. So the current PepsiCo mission as of today is to create more smiles with every sip and every bite for consumers, customers, communities, the world, and shareholders. PepsiCo frequently updates its mission and vision statements to reflect the company's current business conditions. The company's mission statement highlights the diversification of the company due to its mix of both products and markets. PepsiCo breaks down their mission by target market and sets a mission specific to each target. To start, they go with the consumers. Their goal is to create a smile for all consumers with approximately $1 billion per day. PepsiCo is creating joyful moments through their delicious, nourishing products and unique brand experiences. In regards to their customers, they bring smiles to them by being the best possible partner, driving game-changing innovation and delivering unmatchable level of growth. In regards to the associates and communities, they create meaningful opportunities to work, gain new skills, and build successful careers. Offers a diverse they offer an adverse, inclusive workplace where people are committed to ethically driving top tier performance. In regards to the world, PepsiCo has a goal to bring smiles by conserving nature's resources and fostering a more sustainable planet for future generations. Lastly, in regards to the shareholders, PepsiCo has a goal to bring smiles by delivering top tier TSR and embracing best in class corporate governance. Next slide, please. In regards to Abel's Matrix, in terms of customer service needs, PepsiCo is continuously striving to meet customer demands by creating joyful moments through their products, providing unique brand experiences, and improving their footprint on the world by being environmentally conscious and engaged within the community. In terms of technology, PepsiCo has continued to improve as technology has increased around the world through their enhancement of products and services to include a wider array of brands and convenience factors such as more interactive vending machines, as Nick just mentioned. Abel's Matrix creates a framework for strategic implementation while it's focusing on customer needs, technology, and, cons and customer groups. PepsiCo's customer groups would include consumers and customers specifically as they are being served on the business end. Shareholders would also be considered in this group as they are concerned with the corporate governance factor. Next slide, please.
In terms of PepsiCo's vision, their vision is to be the global leader in convenient foods and beverages by winning with a purpose. This vision has been implemented through two campaigns, the Winning with a Purpose campaign and the Faster, Better, Stronger campaign. Winning with a Purpose is an evolution of the Performance with a Purpose campaign. It is the next step to PepsiCo's journey, building on everything they've achieved over the last 12 years with their Performance with a Purpose program, while propelling the company forward into a new era of growth and prosperity. It reflects their ambition to win sustainably in the marketplace and accelerate top-line growth while keeping their commitment to do good for the planet and communities. The Faster, Better, Stronger campaign has broken down into three categories. The faster section means by being more consumer-centric and accelerating investment, they can increase top-line growth and win the marketplace. They can broaden their, market, their product portfolio and packaging formats to win locally in convenient foods and beverages. They also do this by fortifying the North American business by investing in Frito-Lay North America and PepsiCo beverages in North America, as well as accelerating the international expansion with a disciplined focus to win on right to win markets. The better section focuses on integrating their purpose agenda into their business strategy and doing more for the planet and for the people. They also advance farm, farming practices to optimize crop yields, protect human rights, improve farmer livelihoods, and secure supply. They also replenish more water than we use in water stressed areas so that they can ensure business continuity while positively contributing to the communities around them. Lastly, they create a circular economy for plastic that can fundamentally change the way the world interacts with their products. In addition, they increase the permissibility of their portfolio, reduce added sugars, sodium and saturated fats, and add more positive ingredients. Last with this campaign is the stronger section. They do this by transforming their capabilities and culture, by driving savings through holistic cost management to reinvest in the marketplace, by developing and scaling the core capabilities necessary to better understand and meet new consumer needs, strengthen their brands, and improve customer service. Lastly, they also build differentiated organization, talent, and culture. Next slide, please. The Performance with a Purpose program is one way in which PepsiCo implements the goals to make their vision a reality. The goals are time-bound and are currently set for 2025. These goals are based on the products, planet, and people. In regards to the products, they focus on reducing added sugars, reducing saturated fats, reducing sodium, and increasing positive nutrition. In regards to the planet, they focus on a positive water impact, source sustainability, they're working to achieve zero waste to landfill, have waste food, lower carbon emissions, and recyclable packaging. In regards to the people, they advance respect for human rights, support diversity and working caregivers, and spread prosperity. Next, I'm going to pass it over to Kristen. Okay. In these next few slides, we are going to talk about the external factors of PepsiCo. This is where the PESCAL analysis comes into play. Uh, PESCAL analysis identifies the external forces that an organization might face. This acronym stands for political, economic, social, sociocultural, technological, ecological, environmental, and legal. With PepsiCo doing this type of analysis, they are able to monitor and respond to changes in the environment, differentiate from competition, and create a competitive advantage. In order to point out any advantages or any changes, this is something that must be conducted every six months. Next. Some of these factors can bring threat or opportunity to the company based on how a situation is handled. For example, good government cooperation and relationship along with stability of the economy can bring opportunity to PepsiCo. However, this can be a difficult task because not only does PepsiCo provide services to the U.S., but globally as well. You then have policies and regulations. 
with most of PepsiCo's drinks being carbonated, along with the health of the population being more addressed today than ever, the government has released policies pertaining to obesity, and this has become a major threat to PepsiCo. As for the economic factors, economic stability in developing countries are an opportunity for the company. With stability in countries like the U.S. and higher growth rates in countries like Asia, this provides growth and expansion for PepsiCo. China's economy, on the other hand, could create problems for PepsiCo's international growth rate since they are one of the biggest economies in the world. So if China's economy started to decline, PepsiCo would most likely take a hit as well. Social factors include higher health consciousness, busy lifestyles, and customer attitudes on the products. Higher health consciousness can be a threat because of the state's where population is more conscious about their health. Busy lifestyles can bring opportunity though because people on the go do not have time to sit down and eat a homemade meal. Customer attitudes on the quality of products can bring opportunity as well. Next slide. Technological factors such as research and development investments, management systems, and automation all bring opportunity for PepsiCo. The improvement in management systems with the help of technological advancements is a positive when it comes to expanding PepsiCo, especially globally. Ecological and environmental factors such as sustainability, waste disposal, and climate change are very important to PepsiCo and are an opportunity. Yearly, they release a sustainability report stating what they have achieved environmentally. Recently, their goal is to reduce, reuse, and reinvent their plastic packaging. They commit to the planet and do everything possible to provide a better environment, from waste disposal to climate change. Lastly, legal factors are GMO regulations, health safety regulations, and change. Since GMOs are now regulated worldwide, PepsiCo has the opportunity to reduce its use of GMO ingredients to satisfy the regulations. They can also improve products to address safety and health effects, and regulatory changes give PepsiCo the opportunity to grow with the expectation that its current decisions will satisfy regulatory requirements in the long term. And now I will hand it over to Lakeisha. I, I can't hear you. Are you guys able to hear Lakeisha? Uh, no, no I'm sorry. not able. Are you able to still see her on the screen? Uh, I don't hear on the screen. I mean, I've minimized that, so I don't know. I'd have to go where I put that. Okay, so. Uh, yeah, she's still here. I see her. But we can't hear you. Oops. There we go. Should one of us move forward reading her part? Yeah, maybe one of you guys can help out here. Uh, yeah, I don't, I can't see the notes, but I'll read the phone. Um, I can do it. It's fine. Okay, cool. Okay. So the market forces on firm performance potential. The competitive rivalry with PepsiCo is high. The companies that are able to compete with Pepsi are larger companies within the industry. 
This means that firms in the industry will not make moves without them going unnoticed. Coca-Cola and Pepsi control approximately 60% of the global non-alcoholic beverages industry. Of this 60%, the split between Coca-Cola and Pepsi, respectively, is approximately 40% to 20%. The products produced within the beverage are highly differentiated. As a result, it is difficult for competing firms to win the customers of each other because of each of their products are because each of their products are unique. Both Pepsi and Coca-Cola are committed heavily to sponsoring outdoor events and activities to boost sales. As the industry grows, PepsiCo can focus on new customers versus winning the ones from existing companies. Can you guys hear me now? Yes. Yes. Yep. I just did. You can hear me? Yep. Yes. Okay. Jeez. Sorry about that. Okay. Um, Yay, I can hear Lakeisha. <laughs> Thank you so much. I'm glad. Thank you. Like, do you want to start with this slide with this business model? I can. So let me now. Okay, here we go. All right. Um, PepsiCo has a diversified business model with a strong presence in food and beverage products. In a scenario where carbonated soft drinks have been continually declining, Pepsi, PepsiCo significant presence in the snack and food category gives it an edge over its closest rivals. Both companies have, both companies have, have massive scale. With Coca-Cola, Coca-Cola over 35 billion in revenue compared to Pepsi's over 63 billion in revenue. While Coca-Cola has a large chunk of revenue is in Europe, Middle East, and Africa. Pepsi has its primary operations in the United States, Coca-Cola is the largest beverage, beverage company in the world. Pepsi got diversified between beverages and food, but food represents 53% of its revenue in 2017. Both companies have massive dis distribution strategies, and, and nevertheless, the size that they have a relatively quick decision-making process. That is, that is critical as both companies top into consumer habits, therefore need to be fast and adapting to them. Both companies also spend massive resources on demanding on demanding generations via mar marketing activities. Other Pepsi uh, other Pepsi products that factor into the into the into the competitive market are, are foods, snacks, and fruit juices. Some of these products are Frito Lay, which include Grandma's Cookies, Alberta Beef Jerky, Miss Vicky's Potato Chips, True North Flat Earth. Tropicana Premium Juices, Tropicana Twist, Dole, Naked Juices, Quaker Oatmeal, Life Cereal, Captain Crunch Cereal, Aunt Jemima, and Rice Aroma. The following companies are major food and snack competitors of, Pe of Pepsi. General Mills, Kellogg's, Procter & Gamble, and Cognac Foods. Next slide, please. General Mills is the primary competitor for Pepsi-Cola in the food and snack market. General Mills is a food processing industry based out of the United States. It is a producer and distributor of branded consumer goods that are sold through retail stores. They offer refrigerated yogurt, ready-to-eat cereal, meal kits, soup, desserts, baking mix, pizza snacks, frozen pizza, ice cream, frozen desserts, and various organic products. Other General Mills products and brands are Betty Crocker, Pillsbury, Cheerio Cereal, Fruit Roll-Ups, Chex Mix, Hagen dazs Ole Paso, and Yoplait. Pepsi leads, Pepsi leads General Mills in terms of gross, gross product margin, earn per share, as well as price to book value, but falls behind General Mills in the price to earning as illustrated in the graph below. Next slide, please. This slide gives an example of the different food products that are in competition with Pepsi. Next slide, please. The threat of new entries. The threat of new entries is very low for Pepsi regarding its soft drink products. The product, the product dif differenti differential is strong within the snack industry where the firms in the industry sell different products rather than 
standardized products. They also have access to distribution networks that is easy for new entries, which can, which can easily set up in that distribution channel and come into the business. But the threat, of the, but the threat regra- regarding beverages remains at a low point. There is high initial costs, therefore few companies will want to or can afford to enter the beverage market. With the government policies that are in place, it makes it difficult for new entries to maintain those standards through the costs, which makes the threat of entries a weak force. Next slide, please. No, no, stay here. I'm sorry. Go back one. I'm sorry. Thank you. The threat of substitute, substitutes or substitution. Pepsi-Cola's products could be substituted based on a consumer preference and other variables. Most substitutes to Pepsi products are satisfactory, but generally good in quality. Customers could easily enjoy real fruit juice and brew coffee products instead of drinking Pepsi or Tropicana products. Substitutes are generally affordable, and most of these substitutes are widely available in grocery stores and other providers. These external factors make the strong threat of substitution a priority issue facing Pepsi. Next slide, please. Bargaining power of Pepsi, Pepsi's consumers. Consumers of soft drinks have the choice of switching from one brand to another or other flavors as they all, as often as they like. Consumers in a lower income bracket are, are highly price sensitive and would resort to cheaper soft drink brands or look for substitutes such as juice, tea, or non-alcoholic, non-carbonated beverages. There are so many other, be- many other beverages, products on the market, and consumers have a large variety of products to choose from. The customers are always aware of price and companies should be reluctant to change high, price, high prices, change to high prices because of the number of consumer choices. Customers can choose to switch to other products or even products from companies to satisfy their cola craving. Pepsi-Cola must ensure customer satisfaction to, ma- to maximize its revenues. Bargaining power of Pepsi suppliers. The number of suppliers in the industry in which Pepsi operates is, is a lot compared to other buyers. This means that the supplier has less control over prices, and this makes the bargaining power of suppliers a weak force. The product that these suppliers provide are fairly sub- standardized, less differentiated, and have low switching costs. This makes it easier for buyers like Pepsi-Cola to switch to, to switch suppliers. This makes the bargaining power of suppliers a weak force. The high overall supply increases Pepsi's options in acquiring raw materials, thereby reducing the bargaining power of suppliers. The suppliers do not contend with other products within the industry. This means that, they are, that there are no other substitutes for the products other than the ones that the suppliers provide. This makes the bargaining power of suppliers a strong force within the industry. At the end of the day, suppliers would not want to lose a mega customer like Pepsi. I'll turn it over to Nick. All right, now we're gonna talk about the um, food and beverage industry structure. <clears throat> um, the food and beverage industry contains companies involved in, pro- in processing raw food materials, packaging, and distributing them. This includes both fresh and prepared foods, as well as packaged foods, alcoholic and non-alcoholic beverages. So pretty much any product meant for human consumption aside from the food and beverage industry. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, the food and beverage industry is a fragmented industry because it consists of a large number of smaller, medium-sized companies, none of which is in a position to determine industry price. However, in terms of strictly the carbonated soft drink industry, which includes Pepsi, that would be considered a consolidated industry. A consolidated industry is dominated, dominated by a small number of large companies, and such companies are in a position to determine industry price. The carbonated soft drink industry has long been dominated by Coca-Cola and Pepsi. So by definition, the carbonated soft drink industry would fall in the category of a consolidated industry. The food and beverage industry is divided into two major segments production and distribution of edible goods. Production includes the processing of meats and cheeses and the creating of soft drinks, alcoholic beverages, packaged foods, and other modified foods. The production segment of this industry excludes foods that were directly produced via farming and other forms of agriculture. Distribution involves transporting the finished food product into the hands of the consumers. Next slide, please. 
Uh, the, the food and beverage industry represents one of the largest global industries today. Some of the world's top food and beverage companies include PepsiCo, Coca-Cola, Nestle, Kellogg's, Unilever, and Mars, to name a few. Next slide, please. Okay, so these charts represent revenues and future projected revenues of the food and beverage industry. According to research from Statista Market Forecast, worldwide revenue from the food and beverage industry amounts to over 108 billion so far in 2019. That number is expected to increase to about 159 billion by 2023. Food and beverage revenues are expected to increase by 14.1% in 2020. In addition, revenues are expected to show an annual growth rate of 10.1% for years 2019 to 2023. Next slide, please. Uh, these two charts represent the uses percentage, percentages of PepsiCo products by age and gender. So individuals 25 to 34 years of age represent the highest usage percentage at about 34%. 18 to 24 years of age is about 20%. 35 to 44 years of age, about 25%. 45 to 54 is about 16% and the oldest age group of 55 to 64 years of age make up a, a usage of about 6%. And users by gender is about 50-50, so pretty much what, what you would expect. Uh, next slide, please. This chart represents usage percentages by income. So lower income us users have a usage of about 29%, medium income, 31%, and higher income users have a usage of about 40%. Oh, now I'll pass it over to uh, Elizabeth. Yes. Okay, so since 2012, Pepsi has been recognized for receiving over 400 awards as one of the world's leading corporate innovators based on their creative designs. The Bring Happiness Home campaign debuted in China for the sixth year in a row, generating more than 1 billion views. The beverage industry focuses on high quality beverages in order for PepsiCo to achieve its production goals, increase sales, have market recognition, utilize its capacity, and meet all company wide goals. Porter's Five Forces Analysis is a strategic management tool to research trade and receive underlying levers of gain on an exceeding, exceedingly given trade. PepsiCo is a company that can utilize the five forces to grasp how the competitive forces of the industry influence gains and assist their management in a developing method for enhancing Pepsi's competitive advantage and future gains in the beverage and soft drinks trade. The differentiation factors include cutting edge designs. An example of this would be Lifewater, where they use local artists on the labels. Campaigns that concentrate on relatability, for example, the Gatorade made for this campaign and partnerships with major leagues. In addition, they have new channels for growth with driven results through e-commerce and investing in digital, cap digital capabilities. For example, the NFL gift packs bring happiness home campaign. Next slide, please. The chart shown on the left represents the top three competitors of PepsiCo based on their generated revenue of the companies. Mandala is a food processing company, is PepsiCo's number one competitor, but generated $39.6 billion less in revenue. Secondly, Kellogg's, a company in the packaged foods and meats industry, generated $51.78 billion less in revenue. Lastly, in terms of this comparison, Nestle, a company focused on the beverages industry, similar to Pepsi, generated $27.5 billion more than PepsiCo. Out of the top 10 best-selling snack brands, PepsiCo owns eight of them. Next slide, please. These eight include Lay's, Doritos, Cheetos, Ruffles, Tostitos, Wavy Lay's, Fritos, and Tostitos Scoops. In terms of overall profit, the snacks portion of the PepsiCo business generates more profit than the beverage industry. Now I'm going to turn it over to Kristen. Okay, here in this slide, we have the PepsiCo financial performance trends and projections from 2010 to 2023. 
In the upper left hand corner, we have sales, which is how much the company has made. According to the chart, the company started declining in sales in 2014, 2015. This was most likely due to customers tilting towards healthier options such as tea and flavored water. PepsiCo ended up launching Pepsi True around that time, which was a naturally sweetened drink, but customers did not approve of it. PepsiCo's goal was to then look into diet variants of soda and hope to recover the lost customer demand. Since then, PepsiCo has come out with Pepsi Zero, which has received positive customer feedback. They have also extended their reach into sparkling waters and sport drinks by acquisitions with Life Water and creating Bubbly and Gatorade Zero. PepsiCo also acquisitioned Soda Stream, which is the number one sparkling water brand, in 2018 at $3.2 billion. And this explains their positive outlook in sales in the upcoming years. Operating profit margin, the right upper hand corner, indicates how much of each dollar of revenue is left over after cost of goods sold and general operating expenses. PepsiCo started seeing an increase in late 2016, which was positive for the company. This year, though, 2019, they took a major drop, most likely from competitors such as Coca-Cola in higher operating costs. However, they expect to remain stable in the years to come. Return on investment is the amount of gain from an investment, and it looks as though PepsiCo has managed to grow in net come each year, minus the small drop in 2017. And return on equity is a measure of the company's financial performance. It looks as though when they acquisition SodaStream, they became dependent on debt for its financing, which boosted their return on equity but the higher return on equity meant they were also looking to increase their ability to generate profit. As they get established and grow with this new acquisition, they expect to balance out their debt in the year 2020. The benefits of this come from investing earnings to aid in company growth. Next slide. Okay, on this slide, we have long-term debt. It peaked in late 2017 due to loans being taken out which explains why the equity did the opposite more debt means less equity obtained this is most likely from the situations explained in the previous slide that PepsiCo faced as the years have progressed the long-term debt has been steadily decreasing while the equity has been increasing this means PepsiCo is becoming less dependent on loans and making more equity off their investments Next, the capital and leverage have both been decreasing since late 2017. Low leverage means more equity than debt because PepsiCo is not having to use borrowed capital as a funding source, and this is good. The reason why leverage peaked in 2017 was because PepsiCo used a significant amount of borrowed money to meet the cost of acquisition. They also made several acquisitions to enhance Frito-Lays by purchasing Sun Chips. Due to the strong earnings and sales in 2018, PepsiCo is op optimistic that their earnings will grow by 4% in the year 2020. This decrease in leverage means PepsiCo does not plan on making any more acquisitions as of now, and that explains the decrease in um, return on equity in the previous slide. Capital is the accumulated asset of a business that can be used to generate income for the business. Even though PepsiCo expects to continue decreasing this year, they expect to change that direction next year. Overall, since the decline in 2017, they have slowly worked their way out of that hole and plan to continue. And now I'll turn it back over to Lakeisha. All right, can you guys hear me this time? Yes. yes. Thank you, <laughs> okay. <clears throat> capability analysis functional business business capability is the expression or, or the articulation of the capacity materials and expertise and organization needs in order to perform core functions this strategy focuses on how the organization will approach its basic functional capabilities they are measured in marketing financial production research and development and human resources Marketing, 
PepsiCo's marketing mix has, invo- has evolved over time, especially because of the effects of mergers and acquisitions. The marketing mix or 4Ps, product, place, promotion, and price, is the combination of strategies and tactics that the firm uses to implement its marketing plan. In this regard, Pepsi em- employs various strategies and tactics based on its array of products and brands. Finance. Pepsi is totally self financed Pepsi does not have to rely on loans and other financing activities. Pepsi has a finance department controlled by finance managers. Financial difficulty is only associated with increase of inputs and prices remaining the same. Production. Pepsi, Pepsi Cola generates $3 billion in production savings between fiscal year 2012 and 2014. The company is now pursuing a five-year productivity program with an aim to generate five, $5 billion in productivity savings from fiscal year 2015 through 2019. PepsiCo's initiative to implement packing automation in about one-third of its snack plants worldwide has helped the company reduce packing labor costs in these facilities by at least 50%. Through its geographical enterprise solutions at its Frito-Lay company in its North America division, PepsiCo has been consolidating certain plants and distribution networks. Pepsi is selective, selectively outsourcing financial transactions, proceedings, accountings, reporting, and other back office tasks. Research and development. In the area of research and development, Pepsi experimented and created Gatorade Sports Science at the Sports, the Sports Science Institute, where they're studying new and innovative ways to help athletes improve performance through proper hydration and nutrition. Fortify nutrition credentials further with, further with new innovations across the Quaker portfolio. The introduction of Real Melodies products in 2012 contemporized the Quaker brand. Expanding from a North American focus research and development operation to a geographical diverse organization with research and development centers of excellence in Asia, Europe, Latin America, and in addition to North America. Pepsi plans to evolve from a go-do research and development function that simply executes product line extensions to a go-to global research and development function that with the ex- exact precision delivers new innovative products and new categories. Human resources. PepsiCola recognized the importance of maintaining and promoting the functional human resource of employees by, operate, by operating under strict programs and policies. Pepsi promotes a workplace free of discrimination and harassment, prohibits child labor, forced labor, and human trafficking, provides fair and equitable wages, benefits, and other conditions of employment in accordance with local laws. The government, along with the FDA, ensures that carbonated soft drinks are safe, sanitary, and honestly labeled. The FDA has established current good manufacturing practices, better known as CGMPS, for carbonated soft drinks, which describes the basic steps manufacturers and distributors must follow to ensure carbonated soft drinks are safe for the population and consumers to drink. Now I'll turn it over to Terry. Okay, folks, let's look at PepsiCo's organizational capabilities analysis. And we're going to start with the company's executive leadership team. The company is currently headed up by Chairman and CEO Raymond LaGuarda. He was appointed in October of last year, taking the place of Indra Nuyi, I think that's how you say it, who had been the company's CEO for more than 12 years. In addition to Mr. LaGuarda, the company also has seven executive vice presidents. Each one of these has a specific area of expertise. One serves as the chief finance officer. One serves as the chief human resources officer. One serves in three capacities as uh, in charge of government affairs, general counsel to the company, as well as corporate secretary. One serves as as the chief sciences officer. One serves as the global communications officer, in addition to being the president 
president of the PepsiCo Foundation. One serves as the global operations officer, and one serves as, in, he's in charge of new ventures, SodaStream, and Beyond the Bottle. The company's executive leadership team also has two senior vice presidents. One acts as the controller and one as the chief information officer. The executive leadership team also includes a global chief commercial officer and a chief global diversity and engagement officer. PepsiCo uses sophisticated technologies in its production operations. Sustainability plays an important role in the company's corporate social responsibility strategy, as well as is a solid source of value addition. PepsiCo also adjusts its products to meet local taste and preferences. Now we're going to talk about the company's divisional structure. PepsiCo has a decentralized divisional structure, and it is comprised of PepsiCo Beverages N.A., Frito-Lay N.A., Quaker Foods N.A., PepsiCo Latin America, PepsiCo Europe and Sub-Saharan Africa, PepsiCo Asia, Middle East, and North Africa, PepsiCo Global Food Service, and uh, I'm sorry, PepsiCo Global Foods, PepsiCo Mexican Foods, and PepsiCo Latin American Beverages. All of these divisions have either a CEO or a president. Now we will discuss the company's value chain. PepsiCo's value chain consists of inbound logistics, operations, outbound logistics, marketing and sales, and service. As you can see to the far right, you see how each division, major division of the company comprises the sum total. Out in, in terms of inbound logistics, the company has 22 brand portfolios. The portfolios generate more than $1 billion per year. Inbound logistics practices reflect the nature and quality of raw materials, the proximity between suppliers and raw materials, as well as other factors. Inbound logistics practice, I'm sorry, economies of scale are created through inbound logistics processes and reduces transportation costs. Technology is a driver for PepsiCo supply chain, and an example of this would be PepsiCo's innovation of 3D chip prototypes through 3D printing. I had never heard of such a thing before this project. In terms of operations, there are six operational segments of the company. We've stated these previously. There's Frito-Lay that focuses on snack foods, Quaker foods, which focuses on foods such as cereal, rice, pasta, etc. There's Latin America that focuses on snack foods such as Doritos, Cheetos, etc. Asia, Middle East, and North Africa, which focuses on various snack foods. Europe and Sub-Saharan Africa, which focuses on snack foods. And North America, which focuses on fountain syrups and finished products such as Pepsi and Aquafina. Outbound logistics comprise uh, the company's distribution costs amounted to $9.4 billion in 2015, and the company uses multiple distribution formats to create value in outbound logistics. Specifically, PepsiCo's outbound logistics utilize three formats of production distribution. They use direct-to-store delivery. This is popular where product categories are restocked often. This method provides advantages of utilizing merchandising with maximum visibility and appeal within stores. Deliveries to, cons co deliveries to customer warehouses are used for less fragile and perishable products. This is considered the most cost-effective distribution format. They also uh, use distributor networks where third-party distributors are used for distribution of projects products to locations far from PepsiCo manufacturing plants and warehouses. Marketing sales. PepsiCo has an enormous advertising campaign and an associated advertising budget of $2.4 million. The marketing strategy 
employs extensive print and media advertising, social media marketing, celebrity endorsement, and product placement. The message that PepsiCo uses throughout its respective campaigns is one where it strives to make the consumption of PepsiCo products coincide with consumers' perceptions of enjoying life to the fullest by spending active and quality time with friends and loved ones. And finally, service. PepsiCo only sells its product to final consumers uh, through resellers and intermediaries, such as various supermarkets and grocery stores, restaurants, fast food chains, etc. Therefore, the company does not provide direct customer service to the point of purchase consumer. However, PepsiCo does handle consumer service inquiries and questions related to specific brands and products via customer service phone numbers and online contact forms on their official company website. Now we'll take a look at the SWOT analysis for PepsiCo, which outlines the company's strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats. PepsiCo has several strengths. They're, they have a large food portfolio focused on the beverage, food, and snack industry, with again, as we said previously, 22 brands. Their corporate history, they have a corporate history of strong leadership, and their current CEO is again, Raymond LaGuarda. They have brand loyalty across most of their brands, in addition to a long history of successful mergers and acquisitions. All PepsiCo brands share an integrated supply chain and distribution practice. But they do also have some weaknesses. They have a massive dependence on domestic U.S. markets. Uh, Aquafina had a product recall and an associated scandal that was on the news almost everywhere globally. PepsiCo brand is perceived by many as unhealthy due to sugar and salt content of many products. They have no diversification beyond the beverage, food, and snack industry to speak of, and a large dependence on big box supermarkets like Walmart. The company has some opportunities in that they can diversify into other industries, increase the presence in emerging economies, improve the healthiness of some of their products, increase effectiveness of the company's corporate social responsibility practices, and a focus on additional research and development. Currently, the company is trying to do all of the above. Finally, there are some threats. Always, there is increased competition from rivals, continued decline in sales of carbonated drinks, additional product recalls and or scandals, and products continue to be deemed as unhealthy due to the amount of sugar and salt. They have been historically criticized by the government and non-governmental health organizations for those reasons. We'd like to look at, and the next three sl slides are supposed to say corporate social responsibility through sustainability, uh, but we'd like to look at PepsiCo's efforts in their corporate social responsibility and sustainability efforts. PepsiCo has a major global impact in a number of ways. PepsiCo's products are enjoyed by consumers more than 1 billion times a day. They are sold in more than 200 countries and territories throughout the world, and PepsiCo employs more than 260,000 people worldwide. Corporate social responsibility, otherwise known as CSR, through sustainability is one of the company's major goals. Indra Nooyi, PepsiCo's longstanding CEO, who just left in 2018, said the following, our success and the success of the communities we serve and the wider world are inextricably, inextricably bound together. Our aspiration of creating a good company, good ethically and good commercially is now coming to fruition, yielding a broader, more lasting impact than we ever imagined. 12 years ago, PepsiCo embarked on the performance with the purpose journey. As you'll see in the slide, in the slide pictorial on the right, uh, it's hard to read that, but what they've done and the goals they've put together to try to reach by 2025 are as follows. PepsiCo wants to provide access to servings of nutritious food and beverage to more than 3 billion in underserved communities. 
They'll want to make a 15% improvement in water use efficiency among direct agricultural suppliers and high risk water sourcing areas. They want to cut more than 100 calories in added sugars from two thirds of the global beverages sold. They want to cover 7 million global acres with the company's sustainable farming initiative. They want to reach more than 12 and a half million women and girls with benefits from the $100 million they have put forward in company investments. And they want to reduce GHG emissions across the global value chain by 2030. So let's look and see how they've done thus far. In 2001, PepsiCo acquired Quaker and Gatorade, launching the company's commitment to diversity in the brand portfolio. In 2007, the company acquired Naked Juice Company, therefore making investments in the growing nutritious bis nutrition business. In 2008, a lot happened. The company formed PepsiCo Foundation, and the foundation became the first supporter of the water credit program created by water.org. The company launches their Food for Good program, which makes nutritious food more accessible to low-income children. And PepsiCo joins the Health Weight Commitment Foundation to help reduce obesity in the U.S. In 2010, PepsiCo announces its intent to acquire Wim Bill Dan, Russia's leading branded food and beverage company and leader in dairy and juice. In 2011, PepsiCo, a global pro bono volunteer program, is created. In 2012, PepsiCo wins the prestigious Stockholm Industry Water Award for the company's leadership in water stewardship. In 2013, the company launches its Sustainable Farming Initiative now known as the Sustainable Farming Program, or SFP. It aims to improve the crop yields and growers' lives through the increase and in implementation of environmentally responsible practices. The Sustainable Farming Program advocates also for the advancement of workers' human rights. In 2015, PepsiCo reached its initial goal of providing safe water access to more than 6 million people, and this was accomplished one year ahead of schedule. PepsiCo introduces in its performance with a purpose agenda in 2016, and in 2017, PepsiCo was added to the Ethisphere Institute's list of world's most ethical companies and Fortune's world's most admired companies for the 11th and 12th year respectively. So how are they doing? How are they graded against other companies? Give me just one second. When we're looking at PepsiCo's corporate social responsibility and environment, social, and governance, the company was ranked against 17,443 companies. All of the things that they were undertaking in their corporate social responsibility and sustainability efforts had them ranked as a 94. That's an A by all grading standards, and it means that they're doing a really good job. However, they don't think they're doing as much as they could be, and they continue to try to work on bettering their efforts as the years go by. And with that said, I will turn it over to Elizabeth. Give me one second to get back where I am. Okay. Okay, I'm gonna start with this quote by former CEO. When I was a child in India, my mother would ask my sister and me a simple but compelling question. What would you do to change the world? Today, I know my answer would be that I want to lead a company that is a force for good in the world, a company that delivers strong financial performance while embracing purpose in everything it does. Next slide, please. PepsiCo is currently working on improving their portfolio by transforming all aspects from the products to the environment to the people. The Performance with Purpose program manages Pepsi with a short-term focus versus long-term to track environmental impact as well as financial results. 
The sustainability journey started in 2001 when Pepsi acquired Tropicana. As their portfolio was built, adding companies such as Gatorade and Quaker Oats and adding nutritional value with the Naked Juice Company along the way, Pepsi began to ingrain sustainability in their business practices. These acquisitions are what motivated the company to, per to begin the Performance with Purpose program. PepsiCo's main footprint lies in their supply chain. To make progress in this sector, it takes time to help spread best practices. This is something Pepsi has worked on for well over a decade and is continuing to focus on in their key goals moving forward. PepsiCo tracks their sustainability through their value chain. They start with sourcing and agricultural raw materials. Examples of this include sustainable farming, Scope 3, GHG emissions, human rights, and deforestation. Then it goes to manufacturing and packaging. An example of these would include food safety, human rights, operational efficiency, and operational efficiency. The next step is the distribution, distribution stage. These examples include fleet efficiency and workplace safety. They do this by diversifying the sources of energy they use for their freight trucks. The next stage is their marketing and sales. Examples of this would be providing more nutritious options and responsible marketing. 30 to 50% less added sugars in 7-Up and Miranda in more than 60 markets around the world is one way in which Pepsi is implementing this. Lastly, they focus on the customer, consumer use, and end of product life. Examples of this would include packaging and waste. They are helping consumers reduce environmental impact through innovations in packaging such as plant-based bioplastic bags being piloted in three locations across, across the globe and initiatives to promote recycling. As of 2017, approximately 90% of estimated, our estimated PepsiCo beverage packaging worldwide is fully recyclable. And with that said, I'm gonna pass it over to Kristen. Okay, on this slide are PepsiCo's goals for the year 2023. For sales, they expect to see an increase of $9,750,000, which would be a 15% increase. For the operating profit margin, they don't expect much of a change. The return on investment, they expect a 5.5 increase and a 1% decrease on their return on equity. As for long-term debt, they want to see a decrease of 5 billion, which would be a 20% decrease in debt, and an increase of 5 billion in equity, a 33% increase. As for capital, they don't expect much of a change either, and for leverage, a decrease of 12.5%. And I'll pass it over to Nick. All right, so PepsiCo implements a strategy that consists, that consists of six major elements. The first is achieving growth through mergers and acquisitions. Mergers and acquisitions can offer the advantages of gaining access to competencies and infrastructure, reducing direct costs and overheads, and achieving organic growth. Some acquisitions that PepsiCo has taken part in is that of the juice and dairy businesses, Lebedianski mm -hmm. and Wim, Bill, Don in Russia, Lucky Snacks and Maybell Cookies in Brazil, and Alexis Cookies in Argentina. <clears throat> Mergers and acquisitions can be specified as one of the cornerstones of PepsiCo's business strategy. PepsiCo's mergers and acquisition decisions primarily stem from factors such as emerging markets, changes in the competitive landscape, the desire for further growth of the company, and the desire for further growth of the company. By implementing mergers and acquisitions with other food, snack, and beverage companies alike, PepsiCo elevates from just a carbonated beverage producer by increasing the number of markets in which it can make an impact. When PepsiCo is looking to make mergers and acquisitions, they seek companies that will help with the company's growth and are judged to be an easier cultural, financial, and strategic fit. PepsiCo has remained consistent with this mindset and it has helped to make the majority of past acquisitions successful. Accordingly, PepsiCo's future merger and acquisitions will likely remain to focus on food and beverage firms in specific product and or geographic markets where the acquired company will offer established brand loyalty and would benefit from PepsiCo's distribution capabilities that enable growth in an established market. 
This means that not only do, the tar do they target an acquisition well, it also means PepsiCo knows how to integrate the new companies in order to deliver growth and optimize value. Recent acquisitions include Muscle Milk, Health Warrior, and Pioneer Foods. Muscle Milk was acquired in February of this year. It offers a range of protein products that feature nutrients for active lifestyles. Health Warrior is a natural food company that sells nutrition bars and other healthy snacks. It was acquired in October of 2018. Finally, Pioneer Foods was acquired just last month. It is a manufacturer of cereals, juices, and other products that are sold through, throughout the continent. The second element is forming strategic alliances in the global scale. Uh, PepsiCo has formed a strategic partnership with Chingi in China in order to claim a share in, in a growing beverage market in China. Additionally, formation of a joint venture with Tata in India to enhance drinking water manufacturing capabilities and initiation of strategic partnership with Amari in Saudi Arabia is also an example of PepsiCo's adoption of strategic alliances as an integral part of the corporate strategy. Strategic alliances are formed by PepsiCo at home markets as well. Specifically, by forming the strategic alliance with Starbucks, PepsiCo has been able to claim a share from an increasing energy drink market segment. Next slide, please. Uh, the third element is focusing on emerging markets. An aggressive pursuit of focusing on emerging markets has had a positive impact on PepsiCo's bottom line. The year of 2015 witnessed double-digit growth in the sales of snacks in China and Pakistan, and PepsiCo is also strengthening its position in the Middle East. The company has been able to do more than double its e-commerce business in China in 2015. Organizational culture, oh, the fourth step is uh, focusing on organizational culture. Organizational culture is the underlying beliefs, assumptions, values, and ways of interacting that contribute to the unique social and psychological environment of an organization. The nature of organizational culture directly impacts its performance in short-term and long-term perspectives. PepsiCo CEO Andrew Nui, who, who recently stepped down and replaced by Raymond LaGuardia in October, had been known to walk the halls at Pepsi barefoot, sometimes even singing along the way. This fact communicates the willingness she has to embrace her differences with positive implications on employee morale and organizational culture. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, the fifth element is developing and promoting the idea of one PepsiCo. PepsiCo strives to increase the level of association of individual brands with PepsiCo, company values, and philosophy through, through promoting the idea of one PepsiCo. This is meant to be facilitated through sharing supply chain management and infrastructure. As a result, operational costs for many brands within PepsiCo's portfolio have been increased. And the sixth and final is innovation and marketing initiatives. A wide range of innovative marketing initiatives developed by PepsiCo's marketing team include Do It's a Flavor campaign that involved consumers in 17 countries submitting flavor ideas, development of Lipton Brisk Star Wars game application for mobile phones, and using celebrity endorsement in an innovative manner by attracting a popular singer amongst Pepsi brand target customer segment, Beyonce Knowles. Uh, next slide, please. So, Indra Nooyi is one of the most prominent women to lead a Fortune 500 company as of October 3rd, 2018. She stepped down as CEO from PepsiCo. However, she remained a chairwoman on the board of directors through, through early 2019. She is responsible for turning PepsiCo into one of the most successful food and beverage companies in the world. During her tenure as CEO, the company's sales grew by 80%. Due to her 24 years of service to the company, she helped oversee numerous acquisitions. LaGuardia, New Year's successor, has served as president of PepsiCo since September 2017, overseeing global operations, corporate strategy, pub public policy, and government affairs. LaGuardia is also an immigrant, having been born in Spain. He had previously been CEO of the European and Sub-Saharan Africa unit of Pepsi before being named the company's president. According to Nui, he is exactly the right person to replace her and build on her success. Nui has stressed the importance of shifting Pepsi toward healthier food and snacks, saying it was important for the company's future because of consumers, increasing attention to health. 
she can now take comfort with the fact that PepsiCo has built a strong portfolio that has found a balance of products. Only time will tell if her successor will be able to build on her success. Now I'll pass it on to Terry. Thank you. Now we're going to look at PepsiCo's strategic objectives. PepsiCo's generic competitive strategy is as follows. It contains the need to address and stave off the pressure coming from rivals such as Coca-Cola. PepsiCo offers an array of products as we've discussed previously and as such employs generic strategies such as cost leadership and broad different, different, differentiation. Cost leadership is PepsiCo's primary genetic competitive strategy. This strategy focuses on the premise of cost minimization as a way to improve the company's financial performance and overall competitiveness. An example of this strategy would be when PepsiCo strives to compete against Coca-Cola's products and the company offers low prices based on low operating costs. PepsiCo also puts forward special promotional offers with discounted prices. PepsiCo uses broad differentiation as its secondary generic competitive strategy. This strategy enables business competitive advantage using some unique fe features of various company products to attract consumers. An example of PepsiCo using the strategy is marketing laced potato chips as helpful snack products because of the reduced saturated fat content. A, a, let's see, PepsiCo has the following intensive growth strategies, market penetration, product development, and market development. A strategic, a strategic objective for the cost leadership generic strategy is to automate production processes to minimize PepsiCo's operating costs. In relation, PepsiCo's strategic objective for the broad differentiation generic strategy is to innovate products to address concerns about health effects. In terms of the intensive growth strategies, PepsiCo employs market penetration as its primary intensive growth strategy. This strategy seeks increased sales which builds a bigger market share, which supports business growth. For example, the company has always used an aggressive marketing campaign to attract more consumers, minimizing costs and prices in order to attract more consumers, despite market saturation is a strategic objective of market penetration. As such, PepsiCo's generic competitive strategy of cost leadership supports this intensive strategy for growth. PepsiCo's secondary intensive growth strategy is product development. This strategy requires the company offer new products in order to capture more consumers. An example of this strategy is PepsiCo's commitment to continuing to develop products or variants of existing ones, such as low calorie, reduced salt, or low saturated fat variants of its food and beverage products. Boosting research and development investments for product innovation is a strategic objective linked to this intensive growth strategy. PepsiCo's generic competitive strategy of broad differentiation supports this intensive strategy by offering unique or novel products to attract more consumers and grow the business. Finally, PepsiCo applies market development as its supporting intensive growth strategy. This strategy supports business growth by capturing new markets or market segments. For example, the company continues to expand its distribution network to reach remaining markets or segments, especially in developing regions. Due to PepsiCo's significant presence in all regional markets worldwide, market development is only a supporting intensive growth strategy. Expanding PepsiCo's supply chain to support the growth of its distribution network is a strategic objective for this intensive strategy. The cost leadership generic competitive strategy enables PepsiCo to effectively minimize costs despite additional investments used for expansion to new markets or market segments. And I'll turn it over to Lakeisha. Okay, um, impl implementation priorities. PepsiCo's current position as the second biggest firm in the global food and beverage market is based on the company's ability to wield the strength to continue growing through successful implementation strategies that will ensure its sustainability. There are a number of focus areas that are important to PepsiCo's business model. These areas include implementation of programs to research more environmental friendly operations, improve its products to include the use of healthier ingredients, 
and then development, the development of new skills, resources, and advertising, advertising strategies. Next slide, please. Programming products. PepsiCo has in, in, implemented its plant pillar program. This is an associated with the nutrition greenhouse that's powered by PepsiCo. It reduces, reuses, and re innovate plastic, we innovate our plastic packaging, protecting, the, protecting and conserving global water supplies, especially in water stressed areas, and help to improve access to safe water in communities where we live and work. Working to achieve an absolute reduction in greenhouse gas emissions across the global business and supporting sustainable agriculture by identifying and sharing best practices with growers, suppliers, that will protect human rights. Next slide. Food and beverage restructuring. Pepsi has found ways to restructure its products by making food fun through special promotions such as flavor contests and better and better for the customer products using wholesome ingredients and specifically targeting healthier customers and expansion of production diversification. Next slide, please. Pepsi has managed to enhance its develop, develop of new skills, resources, and advertising strategies by identifying more strategic locations for distribution, focusing on how to maximize sales and reduce costs, identify alternative ways to, to fund investments, ensure diversity of talents among employees, and enlisting of celebrity endorsements. And that's the conclusion of our PowerPoint. Turn it over to Terry. Uh, thank you, everyone. But as we close our presentation tonight, I would like to thank my very qualified and dedicated team, which includes Elizabeth, uh, excuse me, Lakeisha Branch, Elizabeth Morris, Elizabeth was our PowerPoint guru, Kristen Patterson, and Nikki Smith. I couldn't have done it without these guys and everybody, despite their schedules, got it done. And we thank everyone for listening this evening. Professor Katie? That was, that was very good. I mean, I, I, more than I expected, actually, because your slides in the beginning weren't as good. These are, like, really good. They're seamless. I mean, they, they, <laughs> well, they're, thank not, you. <laughs> they're not busy. Uh, I struggled before with getting, you know, that the Pepsi is more than a beverage company, but it's, you were very clear here, it is more than a beverage company. There was only one slide that was too busy. That was the one about the, uh, the ex-CEO. But other than that, I mean, you, the, they're well laid out and they're, you use the uh, graphics for the, where they, where they're, well, where, where they do good communication. So, uh, you know, I don't have any questions. I mean, it was really, it was tight, you know, and that's, that's good, so. Uh, Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you. you. Does anybody else have any questions? Well, what I, what I need you to do is I need you to uh, send me the, you know, post it as soon as possible. I'll, I'll grade it, and uh, and then the other thing is I do have a end of course team evaluation. I, I hope you've all were able to see that, and so you should grade the other. I take it seriously, by the way. So you can give somebody a lower grade. It's a scale down one to ten, and uh, the way I grade is I take the average, and if the average is nine, then I multiply. Let's say you got a hundred. For the uh, for the presentation, then I would.